Today's topic is uh, web recording with open source tools and specifically that software that lets you locally record and produce a video from a web session on Linux. So I'm recording this web session of a presentation and it's a little special here because I'm re doing my own recording of my own presentation. So I'm kind of juggling a couple of things here. Because I'm doing that, some of the things I'm demonstrating, earlier I went back and recorded videos and embedded them in my presentation. Once we're done with the presentation, then I might be able to go back and demo anything except anything that has to do with OBS Studio because you'll get that infinite mirror in mirror and mirror and mirror and mirror, mirror for infinity view if, if I tried to do anything there. But I can talk about Shotcut. I can talk about any of the, any of the audio tools if you want to get into that. Uh, let's go to the next slide here. I need to go to, um, go to Libre uh, Office Impress, which is what I'm doing this in. Uh, here we go. Okay, advanced slide. And then... What this is, for what it's worth, uh, and I didn't mention this in the slides, but it's a good thing to have dual monitors. Uh, for example, I'm keeping an eye on OBS Studio on my visa-mounted big screen on the wall. Because I am recording this myself about presenting, the things that I'm going to show, some of the things I'm going to show, I put together earlier and I made videos of those and I embedded those little short videos in this this uh, LibreOffice Impress presentation. And so when I get to those slides, I found that I can't stop them once they start. A couple of them are a couple of minutes long, but uh, you'll see my cursor moving around and I'll, I, I believe I can show my current cursor on top of that. Uh, to show what's going on, so I'll just speak to what I did and had recorded. The reason I did that is, especially for OBS Studio, is you, you just can't, it doesn't work because you're, um, it doesn't work if you're trying to record what you're doing in the t application that you're doing the recording with. I haven't done a lot with video, and I haven't been recording web sessions that much, but I have uh, picked up enough to offer something that I think is going to be useful for everyone. Today we're going to talk about planning considerations. It, and this I have learned, you really need to lay it out first. Think through what you're doing, you know, lay it out in your head, mentally know what you're doing. It's important, you need to know that. The tools you're going to use, um, and these are all open source tools, open broadcaster software, OBS Studio, uh, is used by um, every people, everyone from video creators to professional broadcasting stations, uh, actually putting stuff on the on the broadcast air for for uh, the public to listen to. This is professional grade software. It's used in a professional environment. It's really good. It's very powerful, and uh, we'll go through some of its capabilities because I'm using some of them right now. Uh, the next thing that is going to be important to you on your Linux machine is Pulse Audio. Pulse Audio is your friend. Pulse Audio can trip you up. It's done it to me. And so I'm going to share my experiences, um, hints and kinks as you want to, um, you know, uh, what you can, how to use Pulse Audio, what it does for you, and some quirks to kind of be ready for. Not really, there was a day when you pull your hair out over Pulse Audio. Those days are pretty much gone. Um, next, we're going to talk about the Shotcut Video Editor, and I had been using OpenShot, which is very similar. Then Rich Lucenti introduced me to Shotcut, uh, uh, and uh, I have switched over to that because Shotcut is, um, uh, does almost everything, all the other similar things, but it also does some other things, and it's a little bit more user-friendly, in my opinion, than OpenShot. I'm really not criticizing OpenShot. It is quite capable. I have videos on YouTube that I have produced with OpenShot, and uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a viable alternative for you. Uh, GIMP, uh, the uh, GNU uh, image uh, processing um, mani image manipulation program, I think. Um, anyway, it's sort of like uh, it's an open source um, uh, Photoshop uh, type uh, image manipulation. I have some demonstrations here of what to do with GIMP. Why do I need to use GIMP to produce overlays? What are we talking about with overlays? Um, and I'll get on to, into that later. 
when uh, if you have like during the Mastodon thing, those of you who watched the Mastodon presentation, uh, the presenter had shown some not really personal. I well, yeah, they were personal IPs, not personal space IPs, because that wouldn't be as dangerous. You know, one nine two one six eight. You know, ten dot one seven two dot one. That not that kind of personal space, but stuff that is his a personal IP address that you really don't want that's accessible from the internet that maybe it's okay for him to show in a small group like this of people that, okay, reasonably, you guys aren't going to try to hack his stuff. But if I were to take that and put that up on YouTube, uh, that would have been a problem. So I went into GIMP, and uh, I actually, what you have here in this presentation is the process that I fleshed out in working out those overlays to block out uh, those parts in that Mastodon recording uh, where he had his um, stuff he did not want to show in public. And so um, I'll show you uh, a, a way to do this. And all of this is just a way to do it. And then I'm going to briefly touch on post posting your rendered video on you to YouTube. Uh, those of you um, like Matt, you're on Twitch all the time. I mean, it's your, you should tell us how to do that. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm going to um, just go through a couple of things to consider when you are posting stuff. So planning considerations. Uh, first of all, put your web browser in full screen mode, F11. That's not necessary, uh, but there are two good reasons for it, and you can consider them in uh, whichever order you want. I think the most important order, from my viewpoint, is uh, I might have some other tabs open that I have go have some other websites up. Not that I secretly want to hide what I'm doing or anything like that, but you know, it's just not you know. Um, if I have an email tab, you might inadvertently bring it up and there's a message from a close friend or something talking about something very personal. Uh, it, it just it is just a, you know, um, you know, good practice from a, from a prudent standpoint. The other reason for full screen mode is uh, it gives you, for example, what you're getting now in this presentation. Uh, I have full screen mode, F11. And uh, the if you don't see all my tabs and all the I don't have any other tabs. Meetup.com is the only other one, but uh, and and this pre and this meeting, but um, it, you don't need that extra taskbar up top. And, you know, taking up real estate that could be used for um, the content you want to show. So that's a reason for that. Uh, it's best to use headphones when recording. Um, I didn't use headphones uh, the last time, and I kind of regretted it uh, because uh, I had it on my big comp speakers. I comfortably sat back and listened to this wonderful full quality, you know, sound. And uh, you can't noise cancel that out. It just doesn't work uh, it, because it's not consistent. And you can't noise. It's not noise. because It's just audio. That simply happens to be fed back in. And it, it follows the same pattern, only it has the little bit of delay from the, uh, you know, time the sound travels through the air for the speaker back to through your microphone. It's just a good practice to use headphones. Uh, again, depending on if you have the speakers turned really down a lot to where you can still hear, maybe you can make it work. And in a, in a situation where your headphones are not working or you can't make your, you know, the cable's broken, your connector's broken, or, you know, the, the dog chewed the cable or whatever. I mean, you, you can do it. But you probably want to adjust to have your, your uh, sound cut. In other words, the idea is to not have that sound coming through. This is really important, this third bullet, is confirm your pulse audio settings in record mode. Uh, I have been bitten by this uh, in the past, uh, earlier in the year. Uh, I had everything set up just perfectly. And then hit record, and Pulse Audio opens up all these other sources and sinks and just wrecks everything that I had set up. Like the kid setting up his blocks, you know, and the, and the cat comes down and swats it. Uh, and, and that's an that's, uh, unhappy time at that point. So that's one thing. I, I really followed my own process this morning, and I got everything in record mode uh, before uh, I... I, uh, you know, made sure that my pulse audio settings were set up right. Um, the other thing we want to do is to ensure that audio, and this is another thing that I, this is all, you know, from, this is like after action report lessons learned, uh, basically. 
uh, ensure that the audio from both the remote and the local audio is being recorded. And that's the reason earlier I asked some, uh, someone to say something so that I could get a level on, on the remote audio coming in. So right now I'm looking at two um, audio um, level meters right now. The only one that's kicking up is mine. Uh, because I'm the only one talking. Uh, if someone, you know, you know, t puts their uh, coffee mug down on the on their coaster or something, or or you sneeze or you shuffle some papers across there, I might see a little level coming in uh, from the other side for the remote end. But if no one's talking, that I wouldn't see anything there. I missed a step here. Uh, the bullet above that. Select the screen area to record with OBS Studio and then adjust it. One of my video captures in this presentation shows that happening. We, we can talk about that because that's important too. Uh, because OBS Studio is going has a certain, you know, like a palette area, just like, like GIMP or, or any image processing or video area. <coughs> you have this palette area. And then you want to make sure that your uh, all of your content takes up all the palette area, but doesn't go beyond it. So you want to make you want to make it just right, not too small, not too large. You want it just right so that everything that you're showing is coming through. And uh, just another thing, kind of reviewing back through, know where you double to double check that OBS Studio is actually recording both the remote and the local audio. I've got a slide that's going to show that. And by the way, if any speak up. Um, since I can't watch the chat uh, because it, that'll show up on the on the recording if I open the chat window, uh, please feel free to to uh, call out a question uh, if uh, as as we're going. That's probably the best way to do it. This is um, uh, Open Broadcaster Software Studio OBS Studio, and this is a recording uh, of something I made. Uh, basically, what I did is I just took a, a streaming radio station uh, as one input, and then I yacked into my own microphone, you know, for that input and output. Uh, input would be the microphone, output would be the uh, incoming, um, whatever's coming through the web. In this case, um, the output uh, was the music coming in uh, from the uh, radio station. So um, open obsproject.com, you can see that. It has configurable scenes. Um, think about those as profiles. I guess that's the terminology used in video uh, editors uh, and video recorders. Uh, they call them scenes. I can see why they call that. To me, it's, it, it's more e easier to call them profiles. Um, there are probably one of the most important things in OBS Studio is to select your sources. Um, uh, three sources that you need to make sure that you... Uh, for the three or four, depending, uh, is your video or your window capture. In my case here for this morning, uh, and, and if you're talking about web recording, you, what you want to, the source you want to capture is going to be, for example, Chrome, uh, Chrome browser, or whatever browser you're using. I have one of the uh, demo videos in this um, uh, presentation to show how the menu uh, path to get to do that. Uh, the other thing is the audio capture. Now you're usually going to have just one video or window capture. Audio capture, you might have two sources. I have two audio sources right now and if you're doing recording a web session like a meeting like this where you have um, not just a presenter but you have other people in a meeting or if it's a meeting where it's a discussion meeting or, or a, um, you know, a, a panel meeting or you know, a, a management meeting or, or whatever, uh, a team meeting, uh, you want the audio capture to have at least two um, sources in there. One for your local microphone and the other for the remote audio that's coming in over the internet. Now the remote audio over the internet is going to be everybody else because you only have one other connection. Everybody else is coming through that single connection unless you, uh, uh, and that's going to be the case 99% of the time. Um, and the other thing to consider, and I don't have that addressed here because Jitsi doesn't do chroma key, um, is you need to select an image as the background for a green screen type of uh, thing where, uh, you know, I have a, have a nice uh, photo that, uh, that I took uh, up at Gambrel State Park uh, from uh, one of the uh, mountain, one of the uh, pavilion parks out there where you could look out and see over by Myersville and, and um, Middletown, and it's really scenic. Um, and I can put that behind me. Um, I also have a, a, a picture, another example picture of, of uh, one of the fountains uh, over on the Carroll Creek Promenade. 
Uh, you can you can put that behind you. Uh, but there's a thing. I don't. I'm not addressing chroma key directly here. Uh, but that's how you do it. You have the green screen in the back. Don't wear a green shirt <laughs> if you're using a green screen. It's not just because you yourself will be blocked out and you'll look like this headless person, you know, or a head without any body. Uh, because that's what it would do if you wore a green screen, a green shirt. Because your it's the chroma key is going to cancel out. It's like all it's doing is canceling out stuff. And we'll talk. We're talking about canceling out stuff later on too when we talk about uh, um, a mask in GIMP. Uh, the audio mixer panel is your way to um, uh, test. Like this is what I'm watching when I say give me a level somebody. I'm looking for that bottom uh, uh, level to uh, show me uh, 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 you know show me some indication in there. And of course uh, you can you can see the slider bars there. You can adjust the levels. If somebody's audio is your guy's audio is coming in just a little bit hot and so I backed off my slider bar a little bit uh, so that we would be the same. Uh, but uh, obviously, you um, uh, it's like any sound. It goes up to 0 dBFS because in digital audio, there is nothing higher than 0 dBFS. It, it, it'll just sit there at 0 dBFS, be flat, and come back down. Uh, that, that's a more uh, advanced topic for audio. We could talk about that at some future time. An important thing to realize, and it's a good thing, uh, Open Broadcast Stu OBS Studio saves to an MKV, a Matroska Multimedia Container File. That's very useful. You can manipulate that with FFmpeg uh, quite readily. Okay, here's one of my videos. Um, this is uh, the source selection. So you go down here, you so watch which one our cursor is, and you want to pick um, uh, the uh, window uh, capture. So I want to capture a window. This is my video. Uh, I want to capture a window. I'm not pulling in a video source. I'm not pulling in a camera, for example. I'm pulling in, so I want to capture, pick up a window capture. So uh, so the, the window capture is going to be whatever, and then I can pick whatever open window I've got. In this case, I'm going to use uh, a VNC remote into another machine I have here on my LAN uh, through the Remina um, uh, remote connection uh, utility, uh, but this is just an example. So I'm going to click that. That's the machine name uh, for it. It's a Windows machine, as you can see. Um, and then I'm going to click click that. Now, what I was talking about earlier is sizing it. Uh, it. It shows a certain size. Now look, it keeps its aspect ratio, so you can only pull it up a certain way uh, before you bring it out. And then you can center it, center the whole thing together. So that's the end of my capture. Uh, my, my screen capture for that, so that little video section's over so we can move forward. But um, the, uh, let me see if I can move my own cursor. And yeah, you can see the cursor, I see it. Um, so if I want to add something, I want to go down here at the bottom where this plus mark is, and you click the plus mark. And of course, if I click here, it wouldn't do anything because it's just a, just a, an, a picture. Uh, but then it would bring up all the different properties for that. And I picked up the, this is the window capture. Notice that right now, the only thing I have on this, and that's true for now, I have one capture thing, and that's the window capture. If you were doing chroma key, you would go down here, you'd add another thing, and you would add an image. And then you'd pick that image, and you want that image uh, to go uh, on top because, um, because that image is going to blot out everything, and then the chroma key is going to blot out everything, ex let that image come through, except for what the chroma key doesn't blot out. That's a really simplistic way to describe that. Uh, but if you're doing something uh, uh, on a system like if you're on Zoom, you can use that. Uh, so. Okay, audio source selection. So let you you right click that. So here I'm going to right click it. And again, this is a recording, so I can't. I have to go through the pace that I did at the time. And so audio source selection. So I picked my Logitech uh, camera for my local audio, so my local input. And so then I tap. Now I want to pick my audio output. This is going to be the remote output. Uh, and I want to look there, and, and and I could pick it up from the HDMI. That's my my um, speakers. But at this point, I'm taking default, which is going to be the uh, Impulse Audio Analog Stereo Duplex, um, and so it's going to pull in the um, Analog Stereo for that. So that's those are two special things that are really important uh, to make sure. So what, what we've done just now is we've selected the video portion for the recording and we've selected the audio portion for the recording. So we're about ready to go here. So uh, 
let's get into some of the things about Pulse Audio. Uh, about 10 years ago, some of you might have recalled some forum posts and stuff. Oh, there's a lot of hating on Pulse Audio. <laughs> uh, uh, audio on Linux has really come a long, long, long way. And um, uh, it does have some advantages. They, they've really, it's sort of like a layer over top of the uh, advanced uh, Linux sound architecture. So, yeah, you can dispense with Pulse Audio and do everything in ALSA, but you're probably going to have to do a lot more tinkering if you do straight ALSA. Uh, and it's um, um, there's a lot of things that Pulse Audio does good and bad, does for you automatically, and and that, that can be good, that can be bad. But if you manage that automatic stuff, you can probably navigate your way through Pulse Audio. Uh, the, uh, it controls which apps use which sound sources. And that's really nice to be able to have that capability. Uh, and that's why I did use uh, Pulse Audio. I've learned to use it. Uh, and it, is, uh, it does give you a lot more capabilities than just trying to do also directly. Um, you know, sort of like the difference, but it's not as, not as extreme as, you know, um, or, you know writing um, uh, assembler language versus, you know, Python. It's not quite that you know, extreme, but it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot better. Uh, it gives you a lot more control. The thing about Pulse Audio, and I want to point that out, that makes a big deal about it, is dynamically. Um, dynamically is probably a key to Pulse Audio that maybe wasn't quite as true uh, several years ago, um, but it really responses. The term sources and syncs uh, is sort of uh, Pulse Audio specific. You can kind of infer what that means. Yes, a source like a microphone is a source, and a sound card is a sync. Or, uh, you know, source is like something that produces output, a sync is something that takes input. But a sound card could be both a source and a sync. A sound card could produce, you know, sound coming in, you know, from an outside line, uh, or it could, um, you know, uh, send sound out uh, to your speakers or headphones. This control here, it's a command line control, but it opens up a GUI. And uh, uh, the Pulse Audio, you can do stuff in command line with Pulse Audio, but the GUI is really, really helpful. Uh, so whichever you're most comfortable with, uh, you can do it either way. Uh, that's a nice thing about Pulse Audio. If, you, if you're comfortable with the GUI, they have, the GUI's good. Uh, the GUI has uh, has different tabs for recording and inputs and outputs and and different uh, uh, configurations, uh, um, uh, and which makes it useful. But you could do the exact same thing, and if you need to, with much more precision uh, with command line, if you need to. And so, except if you're going to do command line, make sure that you write down what things you entered and what things you're opening and what sources and sinks you've activated uh, so that you, re you can remember what you and determine what commands to uh, determine the particular state Pulse Audio is in. Uh, but if you have all that together and you're comfortable doing that, that's great. That works. And it does. I I've done it both ways. Um, an important thing to do, remember is to, with Pulse Audio, check after you have started recording uh, that everything is, is um, uh, uh, working. That's one of the advantages of having dual monitors. Uh, for example, I'm looking at my presentation on one screen and I'm keeping, keeping an eye on what's going on with OBS Studio in the other screen uh, because um, uh, right now it is, is, it's recording. I'm watching the recording counter, uh, the clock run. Uh, I'm also seeing that uh, it's taking my audio and whatever there's a every, every now and then there's a the the jitsi or something push makes a little thump or something uh, uh, and I I see the um, or uh, level indicators from that uh, in it so I see that everything's working that's some, that's what you want to do and uh, it's kind of a good idea to as you're going through your presentation or as you're going through if you're not doing a presentation like I'm trying to talk and monitor this thing at the same time if all you're doing is monitoring it you're in good because you could just um, you know just kind of, kind of keep an eye on it as you know the presenter or the meeting facilitator is, is conducting the meeting or the other participants in the in the team are talking with each other about uh, you know whatever project your uh, task you're working on so uh, it, it, it's good to have that there to be able to watch. Uh, Pulse Audio, once it starts uh, operating, is set, and you don't change anything, Pulse Audio is not going to change on its own. 
Pulse audio generally only changes when something else changes. You change something. The Something worth mentioning, because you'll see it discussed, is alternatives to pulse audio. Jack is one of those recursive uh, uh, acronyms like GNU uh, that stands for the Jack Audio Connection Kit. Um, you'll hear uh, people who are in professional audio, specifically musicians or, or, or recording studios, re professional recording studios that are using um, uh, Linux. Uh, they're probably using Ardor and, uh, and Jack. Um, the thing about Jack is that, and I played with it, uh, it, it's, uh, it it's a pull-your-hair-out thing also. Uh, audio has always been a pull-your-hair-out thing on, on basically everything, uh, um, uh, Windows and Linux, uh, although it's getting much, much better. Uh, and the, one of the reasons it's so difficult is audio is so down deep in the machine. You're dealing at binary calculations uh, inside. And, and uh, when you start dealing with something like Jack, which has its pa patch kit, patch panel, um, you know, virtual patch panel, it's, it's establishing all these internal connections um, uh, inside the machine. The thing about Jack is you almost have to have a dedicated piece of hardware specifically, and you set it up and you get it tweaked just right, and you don't touch it. Uh, that's not practical for a machine that you, you're recording different things on. Um, so um, that, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, something to keep and watch for in the future is, uh, and Rich, you may have an update on this uh, uh, with the development of this, but this uh, utility called Pipewire. Uh, I think, as I my reading shows it, it, they I think they eventually intend Pipewire to release to excuse me to replace Pulse Audio. Uh, if Pipewire uh, Pipewire also, I'm thinking, I guess I confess, I'm hoping uh, Pipewire also could replace Jack. Um, uh, it's it's reaching out to these solving some of these problems that both Pulse Audio and Jack are trying to solve. Why am I talking so much about audio? Because audio messes you up. It's so easy to get messed up with audio. Uh, here's the... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, quick question. So when you look at like graphics and devices, there's color management system in Linux where it takes the color you intend to display, but it has a way to translate for a specific device because not all devices show orange or red or blue exactly the same. So there's slight tweaks and adjustments that occur. Is there anything like that with audio, like a, you know, different types of microphones or things where there's some way to make sure that the sound is the, you know, speakers or things like that, make sure the sound is the way it was intended, or is it all not like color and things like that? That's a good point to bring up, and, and it, it's, uh, uh, I think the answer is yes, but let me explain what I mean by that. Um, uh, I, uh, since you brought it up, uh, I had recorded uh, a web uh, a web video off of YouTube, and this uh, the the person's face was blue. Uh, there is a there are some settings inside the settings of OBS Studio that flips that um, because it does sometimes it does you know gets it. It's like it's not exactly a little endy and big endy in, but it's kind of that kind of thing, and it flips you know it it it. It translates it translates it according like you know handling uh, it's different in coding uh, um, and so you can adjust for that in OBS Studio um, in audio for different types of microphones the only thing that I'm aware of that that does something similar to that would be the um, the mixing um, uh, you know the multi uh, band multi audio band mixing thing so um, because an audio a microphone is probably going to most microphones try to um, uh, you know be as flat if you would in in terms of their response. Uh, uh, sometimes you might want, believe it or not, want uh, some of the highs to uh, be emphasized. Um, that would keep that in doing that. Um, uh, you would kind of you know boost the the high frequencies, higher higher audio frequencies would uh, get um, more ampl amplification than the lower audio frequencies. Um, the advantage for that is uh, 
Oh, why not? You want it to sound, you know, baritone and bass, you know. Uh, but if you have something that sounds like the remember the old the old old radios, uh, you know, where you had the tone control, and all it did was make something sound muffled. It didn't make it sound fuller. Um, uh, and uh, if and if you blow have a, a speaker that's blown up, I had a, a, I was driving an old um, car from from uh, part of the work fleet at some time uh, ten years ago. And uh, to be able to hear something coming through it, I had to turn the, the bass all the way down and a treble all the way up, and then it would sound normal uh, because the speakers were so messed up. Um, that would be the only thing that I could think of it as adjusting, uh, you know, compensating for something from a mic that way. Um, the uh, I think that's what you're getting at, Rich. I don't know that there's anything where you could say maybe there might be someone who's done like plugins that are like profiles that someone's already done all of that tweaking, all that manual tweaking, and they've made it into a plugin. So you've set like this profile for this microphone to make it do this, but all they're really doing in the end of the day for that, uh, from from my understanding, is it's just a matter of um, uh, managing the uh, mixer. Uh, sliders for right. that, um, but it is a, you may want to do that uh, for a particular microphone that you have, especially if you're if you're using uh, your only alternative is say you're out in the field and you're on your phone and you just have your earbuds and that little thing dangling you know in, in the middle and, and you you might on your phone might want to uh, uh, if you have an app that will do that that might be something worth doing so it's worth mentioning it really is especially uh, if you are doing a remote uh, presentation or a remote recording like in the field of a field an event you know remote event. So this is what Pulse Audio on the screen here is uh, what the Pulse Audio volume control looks like. As you can see that the, um, uh, let me get the uh, pointer here. As you can see, the recording tab is selected and the remote audio is coming from the desktop. The local audio is the input capture. Uh, things to double check your sources in this. These are your sources for it. So I'm pulling my remote audio from the uh, built-in analog stereo system, and I'm pulling the uh, local audio direct from the uh, webcam in this case. Now let's get into some editing. Once you've done your recording, you got your Matroska file, and uh, you have it saved. And uh, so uh, I always save my raw file someplace else so I don't touch it. You know, I copy it over to something else. Oh, that's just like anything else. You work from a copy because, you know, there's not going to be another recording. You know, don't mess that one up. Uh, and so you, you make a copy and you work on that. If you mess it up, fine, you start over. Uh, and you have something to start over from, too. Uh, thank you, Rich, for introducing me to Shotcut. We're going to be going through that a lot today. And uh, um, you can install it on your, on your Fedora machine. Uh, you have to use the RPM Fusion uh, free updates repository. So uh, you can't use the stock. It's not available in the, in the stock repositories. You have to uh, enable the uh, RPM Fusion repositories for it. Or go to shotcut.org and, and, and load it down. The advantage of using it from a repository and the Debian world, um, you know, apt-get uh, uh, correspondence, they have, they have the same thing. They do the same thing. Um, is uh, is when you update your machine when you do your update you know you know DNF you know update or DNF upgrade or app get upgrade or uh, you know you you you're going to it's going to reach into and and get you the latest version of it so you don't have to go keep going that's the beauty of repositories uh, uh, your your machine updates itself I have a cron job on all of my Linux machines uh, to update nightly over in the overnight each of them updates themselves. Um, and so, uh, and, and I, I double check the logs, um, uh, and usually there's a lot that gets updated. Um, so, uh, we're about to go into a new, uh, a version of Fedora, for example, and usually the early versions of Fedora, uh, releases, uh, are an awful lot of updates. I'm still on Fedora 32 here. I wasn't going to take any chances, uh, you know, between now and then. Um, so, so Mark, one, one comment yeah. on Shotcut. The, yeah. first I, the first time I tried it, it was like stepping onto the flight deck of an airliner with no training. Like, there's just so many things, that can, <laughs> and it's a little overwhelming. Well, you know, that's interesting because I had that feeling about open, open shot. 
And Shotcut actually had less of that feeling, uh, but, you, but you're absolutely right. Uh, and uh, that's one of the things I'm going to, because of that, you're ab yeah, absolutely right. Be and because of that, I'm going through very specific things to specifically look for um, because it has all these menu options. You're not, you're not going to use 70% of them right away. Um, but um, so we're going to go be going through that very quickly here. Uh, some things to keep in mind about Shotcut and uh, is that it uses layered tracks. Layered tracks are very important for both video and audio. The nice thing about Shotcut is it has different kinds of tracks, video tracks and audio tracks. Really helps you keep things together. This is great. Um, you can use st put still images in a video track and the position can be animated. Now that's where you start getting into some of the fancy stuff. Uh, and uh, I could, uh, after we're done with this, I'm not running the PowerPoint anymore or the uh, Impress anymore. Um, we might, you might, I might show some demos of that, of what it does. OpenShot does the same thing. Um, so there are the things in, um, uh, so besides the tracks, uh, which are really where you're doing your work, the tracks are your timeline, and we'll show that. There's a main display area in Shotcut, and OpenShot does this too, uh, showing real-time changes. That's very useful because you can see instantly what you've changed. It has a playlist area for staging clips and components. You stage everything there. And I prefer, playlist is, to me, is kind of a misnomer. Playlist is something that you use for a, a media player. I have all my tunes in, in this, this, this audio player, media player utility, and I'm ready to go out jogging or, or riding my bike or something. I'm going to listen, you know, and, I'm, and, and uh, I have this playlist done, or I have a YouTube playlist. Uh, it's not really that, because it doesn't, it's, you don't start playing, it goes through that. It's really used for more of a staging area. So the playlist is really, I, I think staging. Uh, it's a hor I know, I'm sorry. The playlist is a horrible term uh, from my view. Uh, uh, you're really just staging stuff. And the nice thing about Shotcut is you have the work areas are scalable versus each other. Uh, for example, the main you can you can you can um, grab a little uh, a handle and 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 move it up or down or right or left. And if say if, say for example, if you have a whole lot of tracks, you can push the main play area up and reduce that, um, depending on what you need. I took this. I was going to create my own cut of this, but I, this guy made this really nice uh, Creative Commons licensed picture, which I've only added to in one spot. Uh, but this is what you're, th so this is what Rich is talking about, you know, okay, where's my pilot's license? I got to get going with this. Um, it, it's the, uh, a lot of these are redundant. Um, uh, you're going to show the playlist. <clears throat> you can show it any number of ways. You could do that down here. Uh, you can apply a, apply a filter, show the timeline. You always want to show the timeline. That's down here. Uh, so you show the timeline. But it's nice to have those, those um, um, icons up there in the sort of like the main um, menu list. It's useful. You can get to it. But uh, frankly, I haven't really gone to that part of the bar that often. I've done it other ways. This is... Um, um, Oh, this is another feature here, and you'll a lot of applications have this. Is this teensy weensy little X? It looks very much like the old motif, you know. Close the window X, you know. Every every desktop, you know, uh, arrangement has an you know X out the app. That's all that is. So I could if you click if you click this if you click this X here, it would close this playlist panel. I don't think you would ever want to close your playlist panel because these are your basic raw components that you're going to be working with. So playlist, you know, other panels may appear here as well. That's true. And he doesn't show that in his view, but you can you can select between, um, if you're ready to export, you can get rid of the playlist and use this area to show export. And I think one of my videos shows how to do that. This is the, um, this area here is the, uh, your main, what you're actually showing, where your cursor is at this point. So this picture right here, the sky and the tree, and I guess that's a river or a lake, I don't know. The right down here is where your, where your cursor is, where, where my, my cursor is. Um, uh, and for what it's worth, this uh, blue cursor is something so I could see it. It's the oxygen um, blue, um, um, you know, um, 
uh, I forget what you call it, you know, personality. Um, another thing here is you, if you want to add a clip to the playlist, you could do that. You know what? I'll tell you right now, a better way to do that is to open a file, which is how you insert a file. OpenShot says insert, you open a file, it shows up here, then you click it and drag it over to your playlist. Really, really easy. And if you want to add something to the playlist, you grab it and you drag it down to one of your video. So if I want to take this highlighted here, I'll drag it down and I'll put it at the end of, uh, uh, of the, what's already in there and that works as well. What I added uh, is the job status. And this is the only time this is really useful for that I found is when you're rendering, when you're exporting. Uh, so it'll show the status, it'll show whether it's done. If you're doing just a two or three minute video, it'll be done in, uh, you know, like with a, you know, like a mi in a minute. If you're doing an hour video, like when I'm done with this, uh, you might as well tell it to export and then go do something else. Uh, which is fine. Just let it work. Uh, this is, let me go back for a minute. Uh, the hamburger menu. This right here is a timeline menu. So this this right here where my cursor is, this next slide, that's where we are, right here. This. So you open that up. And I like to do it with the hamburger menu because I like control. Uh, and so I'm going to add a video track. And you can also, oh, this is a video to split a track. Okay, you pick your point here in the timeline. And then you click that little split thing, a uh, little two use. And you see it split together there? And then you can drag the other one and pull it apart. That's, that's splitting or, or deleting it. Uh, if anybody would like me to uh, back up and replay that uh, uh, call out, and, and we could do that. Um, but that, that's, uh, that's all splitting. The main thing here is... You don't use, I don't use all these things, except uh, I do want to snap, that's what that this, this button here is. But this one right here is a workhorse. This is the split button. And you always select your position, not by clicking down in the video, you select your position up here on the timeline. This is where you put your, this is where your playhead put, your playhead cursor. And it's kind of like uh, in audio players, a little triangle. Um, this is where the, the playhead is. I, I love that these, these digital utilities use this old analog terminology. Actually, that's really helpful. There's no such thing as a playhead. It's just a pointer somewhere in its data. But, um, but uh, this, is, this is where your play, it, the, it does. It's good terminology, and it, and it, it explains where you're at. So, Mark. Yes. One thing I've done quite a bit with video editing, and I'm interesting how Shotcut does this. When I'm doing a demo and like recording some demo, I'll just go through the mechanics of the demo first, capture all the video clips, and then I'll cut them into scenes. I'll then record audio separately for, to overlay with each video clip, and then I'll either add a freeze frame before the clip or freeze frames after so that they're, they're time sync with the audio clips. Is there something like that? You could can you do that with shortcut? Is that pretty easy to do? That's exactly what I do. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that I I think that's the best way to do it. Uh, and the reason for that is that you kind of explained why. Uh, some of my audio production quick take videos, for example, uh, which I'd done in open shot, but it's the same thing. Um, uh, that was before I adopted Shotcut. Uh, you you take uh, you go in and you record screen record with no sound what you're trying to demo. This is for like an explainer video of you know how to use a piece of software or how something's working. Um, and uh, it could be anything though. I mean you could have uh, say um, uh, a, a picture you know of a car driving down the street or say in the winter a, 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 a pickup truck with a blade on it pushing plowing snow uh, and you say okay this is how we're, we're cleaning this street today this is how much snow we got uh, and you take the video without any uh, without any um, sound uh, uh, or you leave the sound in there so you can hear the engine running and the blade scraping the pavement and all the things to make it more real um, and then uh, take a take another one uh, of uh, oh here now here's this poor person having to shovel his sidewalk because the snowplow put the sidewalk yeah you need the street cleaned and you also need the sidewalk cleaned um, so suppose though because suppose those are your two um, those are your two vi video clips 
Um, and then you sit down, and I've always sat down separately and written out my narrative or thought what I was going to say, and I recorded it. And if I tripped on my tongue, I went back and redid it. That's the beauty of doing it separately, like Rich explained, uh, described. Because uh, and then the beauty of, of of Shotcut or any video editor like this is you take all these components, and you put them in, you stage them in your playlist, and then you pull them down into the respective video and audio tracks in the respective places you want them to be, and then you put it all together um, and so that everything's all aligned. Uh, another thing Rich just mentioned was, uh, suppose your pickup truck uh, scene, uh, you had a little bit more you wanted to describe about what was happening. You know, maybe you just had a 15 seconds of the of the blade, you know, pushing the snow, you know, over top of the fire hydrant or, or whatever. Uh, be, uh, and and uh, but you wanted to explain that. Okay, here's the here's look at all the snow we're getting. Uh, you know, this is really we have to plow this street because cars can't go through without unless it, it, that snow's been plowed. And uh, then, but you also afterward want to say, now this is really tall snow. We're going to, so you can take a, a still picture of the snow that's covered up the um, uh, fire hydrant and talk ab about that for the next 30 seconds. And you do that by taking, you could just take a still, your last frame of the, of the video, create a separate image of it, you know, separate regular still image file, and pull that still image file into your timeline. Then you can, uh, with uh, by in Shotcut and OpenShot, and uh, probably most of the others, you can uh, grab the end of the um, uh, the still image time part that it's uh, whatever many uh, seconds that the it defaulted and putting it and drag that to end where your narrative your voice narrative ends so you have this you still have this visual you're talking about the snow covering the fire hydrant but and and you, your video stopped but you still have this still frame uh, to show you know what you're talking about is still visually showing so a combination of that yeah when you're doing an explainer video not just a web this is web recording but if you're doing an explainer video you do all those things you've got your video your demo videos and then you have your stills uh, of maybe the main point of that portion of the vid of the video and and then so you have your stills your videos and then your uh, audio narrative or audio sound effects you know you could do that too um, you could take um, uh, you could mix your audio, probably your audio, you want to do all, probably just have a single audio track and do all of your audio mixing separately. Uh, and the reason I would be inclined to do that, uh, instead of trying to do it in a video editor, there's a whole lot more mixing and, and, and precision you can get in something like Audacity um, or, or some other editor like that uh, than you could get in a editor that it's made to put together video. So you get your audio just perfect, and then that's one of the components you put in your playlist area to stage, uh, to uh, pull into your uh, time timelines. Um, you know, anyone uh, want to, you know, um, uh, add add to that or, or describe uh, further? It's interesting, Mark, how that tracks with, like, Hollywood's workflow, where pre-production is deciding what you're going to do, what you're going to say, you know, planning it all out. <laughs> production is where you collect your video clips and your audio clips, and then post-production is where you put it all together. So it follows that same kind of process. It does. It really does. And when you're at, when you're done, you have your mastered version, and you're ready to uh, you know uh, 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 produce and distribute. Uh, absolutely, and uh, I think it's no accident that there's you're basically doing the same thing. Uh, the the process is. Uh, and, but so it make, makes sense to, even if you're doing just something, you know, for your family, um, uh, you want that to be as good as you can make it. And so, of course, you want to think it through beforehand. So uh, the audio component in Shotcut is uh, one thing I've learned. For example, there are a couple of uh, parts here, in, like in the beginning, when I, I think something happened. Um, uh, I'm going to clip... I'm going to clip that out, that part out, of the original before I export the audio to process the audio. 
And yes, you could do the audio processing separately, but man, you're multiplying your work by orders of magnitude and trying to make things line up is not, all. suppose the audio falls in between, so you're dealing with uh, 30 frames per second, um, and you don't want to make it any faster than that because your, your file on disk would be humongous more than it would otherwise. Uh, but the uh, uh, you, you want to um, uh, have the audio exactly what the video is going to be when you're done video editing. Once you're done slicing out parts of the video that you don't want to use, uh, you know, say, you know, something, somebody had a, somebody had a microphone problem and they spent a minute trying to get their microphone problem fixed. Well, that's going to be boring for your, your, your viewers, uh, on YouTube. They want to watch somebody, you know, wrestling with getting their mic. That's not why they tuned into that video. They tuned in to watch the content. Well, you can slice that part out. It's irrelevant. Uh, and then once you have all that together, then you export your audio. Now, uh, the way to export the audios, you and I think I have some examples here, um, but if need be, once we're done with the presentation and I'm not using the PowerPoint anymore, then um, we can, uh, uh, maybe I can bring up Shotcut and we can do some, play around with some stuff a little bit. But um, you, you export the audio. What kind of do I export it to? I export it to dot .wave. Then you, you know, uh, you process it with uh, something like FFmpeg. FFmpeg is a wonderful workhorse. Uh, I use command line FFmpeg for everything. And uh, it, there are a few things I still use socks for, but FFmpeg uh, normalizes, uh, it converts. So uh, I take the FFmpeg and then I pull that into Audacity. Uh, I normalize I. Uh, I won't go through that whole process. Work process take too long. Uh, that that that's that December talk. You know, that, that I don't think I'm going to be doing now, John. Um, but uh, that kind of thing. But that uh, that's something you want to do. And the reason you want to do that is your your phone or your camera or whatever device you're using to capture your video probably is going to pick up room noise. You know. Um, and that kind of thing. It also is going to be not that loud. You want to have your audio as full as possible, and that's why you want to process your audio separately if you have the uh, capability in your machine to do that. Just a, just a recommendation there. Um, uh, so detach it from, and then when you're done, take the audio that's in the video, the original audio, Detach the audio and then remove it from this separate track and discard it. You don't need it anymore because you already have it separated and it's processed. Then you re-import the normalized audio into a new audio track. And if you've done this step one up here, you've done all your trimming first, your audio at the end is going to align perfectly with this. So lip sync is going to be right for someone talking, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, the, um, you know, the, uh, 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 go back to the snowplow thing, the snowplow, you know, uh, hits a bump in the pavement and you hear a clunk. Uh, that's going to be, you know, uh, you, know, as, as a, you know, those kinds of things um, uh, are going to all line up. So that that's, this is all very doable. Uh, for the past several videos that I've been uploaded here. That's what I've done, and uh, um, yeah, it takes a little bit to to get get used to uh, figuring out the and and something like this is not you know it's not super expensive uh, you know v v uh, video studio stuff so you might not have the precision, um, but you can still get it pretty pretty close. Mark, are there Creative Commons libraries of sound effects and things that you can grab for free, or is it all Pay for type. No, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. There are. Uh, uh, I um, I'm trying to remember. I'll go back and play this later. Um, the yes, there are. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I don't have the links um, off the top of my head right now, but I have bookmarked a few of those. Um, the uh, um, there uh, there also is. Uh, you, uh, Look at the uh, little, um, uh, you can also, it's a little, it was made for games, but it makes these little retro 80s game sounds uh, like laser shots and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, SFXR, 
um, uh, Sierra Foxtrot X-Ray Romeo. Uh, um, to look uh, look that up in your repositories, and and it's got this really retro '90s look, you know, to it. But if you're looking for a little quick little blips and sound effects, that's a way of doing it. You can generate your own. It's very very configurable. Uh, that's one method. But yes, there are downloadable things. Um, there are also um, uh, uh, free uh, uh, licenses to uh, other types of audio. Every month I get a free uh, audio thing from uh, Envato um, uh, Sounds, which I had subscribed to uh, to get a theme bed for the podcast I do with my daughter. Uh, and but there are do they have new things coming through like recently Halloween they had a scary one they had, and uh, and then other types of ones like in the, and they've got like jazzy ones and you know funky ones and you know uh, you know upbeat you know uh, type ones uh, so there are all kinds of uh, play they're also um, uh, I forget open source sounds or something like that I think if you did a Google search for it. Um, there, there are several others too. That's a very long way to answer yes. <laughs> let me let me back up and, and run this uh, audio component again. This is what we're going to do with the audio component and make this run again. So I'm going to go up here. This is the original. I'm going to right click it, and then I'm going to say down here detach audio, and it's going to pull it into a brand new. Notice I already had an audio track here. It ignored that. It created a brand new audio track and pulled that audio. That's what you do. Now, when you export it, uh, this is what you export into a WAV file so that you can further process. And this is how you do that. <clears throat> so you have a WAV file, <clears throat> you export the file, and you select I already had the file name, so if you exported something else, go ahead, overwrite it if you want to. Hey, it's your machine. You, you've got... And that's all there is to it. And so, so you can choose, as you can see here, you have um, a number of audio capabilities that you can, you can export it to FLAC, but if you want to do straight linear PCM processing and you need to, to be linear PCM processing, um, then make it a WAV um, uh, file. And, and well, to, to pull that thread a little bit, Mark, I recently got raw audio in M4A format. Oh, okay. And I left it in that format when I edited it. I was afraid that if I converted to WAV, I would lose fidelity because the WAV file was smaller than the original file. Is is there any is WAV the preferred representation, the pulse coded modulation, or is it? Um... I think WAV is probably um, uh, the workhorse, uh, um, what they call it, RAFF, and I forget what the uh, what that stands for, but it's a standard container file for pulse code modulation um, uh, audio. And uh, just to define this, since we're talking, it is a, this is an important topic. Uh, the um, uh, pulse code modulation is, is uh, for those of you who are in telecom, it's like you've been living this all your life. But um, the uh, it's where you have. Um, uh, so many bits, whether it's uh, 16 bits or 24 bits or what, uh, and, and those are like binary values, and uh, they represent a certain, you know, level of sound uh, where all ones means zero dBFS. If, if something is all one, the value of a sample is all ones, it's, it's at zero dBFS. So something less than all ones is going to be somewhere minus zero dBFS. And that, and the reason that's, you can see why that's manipulable, because um, any processor can work the math. You say, I want to decrease the value by so much. Easy, reduce all values by so much amount. I want to RMS normalize it, root mean square, basically aver average. Um, um, uh, normalize it. I want it to be, you know, average uh, energy this much dBFS. So it does all the calculations for the average, uh, considering you know the peaks and all that. Uh, uh, and it, but see, it has something to work with in, in PCM. The reason Wave is probably that everything understands Wave. I, I don't think there's anything that doesn't understand. There are very few things that don't understand Wave. Maybe a few, you know, cheap players that need MP3 or something like that. But uh, the stuff you've got on your machine uh, will do Wave. 
Um, but wave is not it wave is a is again a riff container file. Um, uh, Microsoft built it, I think originally. The other one is Apple's version container of the same PCM values. Uh, now I think it's called AIFF, uh, Apple something file format. Um, but again, you're dealing, most anything can deal, most well, the only thing we have can deal with either WAVE or, or um, uh, AIFF. I would default to WAVE um, simply because uh, uh, everything that you have is going to understand WAVE. And I see here, I don't think AIFF is even a... Um, uh, even a, uh, a, a selection here in Shotcut, uh, which is not a problem. Uh, I could take a WAV file and FFmpeg it, uh, FFmpeg-I for input, uh, you know, say, uh, a file.wav, uh, and then just put file.aiff, <coughs> and it should be, you know, be the exact same PCM values uh, in that AIFF file, in theory. Um, did, I, did I answer the question? I'm not sure. I I think I hit the target there. I, I think so. Like when I went from M4A to Wave, it got smaller. So I thought there was loss of fidelity, but you're saying there's not? No, uh, I don't think so. Uh, you would, if you try to convert from one lossy format to another, uh, for example, if you try to convert from MP3 to AUG or the other way around or something like that, I don't think you're, there's, I'd have to research to be sure, so I'm not sure. I, I don't think, though, whatever loss would be involved would be very minimal. And probably at the very first thing you do, at the, if the very first thing you do is convert from M4A to WAVE, whatever loss is, in, is introduced is going to be very, very minimal, if any. You have you're basically flatlined after that if you're if you're working in a straight PCM. So it would be worthwhile to convert from M4A into into Wave. And I have to look and see. I don't think M4A is a PCM format. I have not really looked into that. Yeah, I think it's the default for the Apple iPhone or something when they record it on there. Uh, it, oh yeah, it it might be. It be. I doubt that it's probably PCM. Uh, but once you, you're not going to lose anything by by exporting to Wave. Whatever loss is there has already been lost in the original file. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah, I should have said that in the beginning. <laughs> now that I thought it through. So let me go back to a scenario. I've done um, everything I've talked about, and I know I haven't covered everything in Shotgun. And we can we can talk about the rest of that later if you want. Um, but. This is important because, I, like the scenario I said last time, I needed to c cover up the, the uh, Bob asked me to cover up the um, IP addresses uh, before it went out to the public on YouTube, uh, a perfectly reasonable request. And so um, uh, here's, here are some of the, I have a few screens here. I'm going to go through the steps and then I'm going to demo the steps. So let's go. So this is what we're going to see the demo do here in a moment. First thing you do is you make a, screen, a screenshot of the scene that the overlay will cover. So you want a screenshot, the, and the only thing you're going to use that screenshot for <clears throat> is to determine where in your overlay you want to put the thing you're going to, you're going to put to cover up everything. In GIMP, you open up the screenshot from a save file or the clipboard, it doesn't matter, as a layer. It's important. It's a layer. And this is also important. You scale that layer to the same ratio as the video. It doesn't have to be the exact same size, but you want it to be the same ratio, as close as you can get it. You know, like if you're, um, you know, what, 10, 1080 by 7, whatever it is, uh, uh, and you, yours is like 1090 by, you know, 780, uh, that's okay. You do, you want it to be close enough. Uh, uh, you want it to be as close as you can uh, to it. Uh, the other thing, uh, next thing to do is you create. Now in GIMP, you create a new layer, and additionally, to, additional to the one you just created with your screenshot, uh, with a s solid background. You know, it, it could be anything. It would be all white or or whatever. All white's fine. Oh, I've used all white. I've used yellow shades. It doesn't matter because you're going to blank that out anyway. The next thing you do on your new layer is you blank it out with black, with a mask 
Um, and the uh, and I'll show you the the black selection. Uh, and sort of like uh, why black? I don't want to black it out. Yes, you do because you want all the basically think of it as similar to being red, green, blue, all, everything zero, and that's going to make that not show up because it's going to be value of zero. That's what you want. Inside your new mast layer, you select the area to be obscured. Now remember, in behind, your, uh, you're seeing that um, screenshot underneath, so you can see what you want to, to uh, uh, obscure it. So you, create a, you select an area. Then you bucket fill the selected area only with a fill color or some, some other pattern. So you're blanking out this, this uh, so, and you can see uh, with the original screenshot uh, the area that you're, to confirm that you're actually uh, blocking out the area that you want blocked. Next thing you want to do is to insert any text or that you might want to put into it. You may or may not want to put text, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, I, uh, but I, I'm doing text, so I'll show how to do text. Um, and then you make uh, the original screenshot layer not visible. By you can do it by unselecting its icon again. This is in your your separate still image that you're creating. At this point, the only thing that should be visible is the little overlay block on on a transparent background. So you got that alpha channel in the back. It shows the little checkerboard uh, thing in the back where it's clear, but it still has the the video part. That's important because you want that. That's important to so that your your obscuring block is going to be placed properly uh, when you put it into your video. Then you take that and you export it to a PNG is fine. Be any other, you know, JPEG or whatever, whatever you want to use. PNG is fine. Um, and uh, and then always save your working result. Uh, I would, you know, just a, as a GIMP working file. That way you could go back if you want needed to tweak it further. You, you don't have to redo the wheel. You've got it there. Just bring it up and tweak it. Or you can use it as a template for something else later if you if it's something that you're uh, say you're doing uh, explainer videos for the same kind of application over and over and over again. Uh, and you want to cover up, say, a company name or a company address or, or somebody's other personal information, um, and it happens over and over again, sure, you, you can go back and use this again. Um, now you import your exported image into the top video track in Shotcut. So that means you're going to open it in Shotcut, and then you're going to drag it over to your playlist, and then you're going to create a new video track and then you're going to, I, instead of click add, I just drag it, drag it down in there. It shows up into the video, into the in the video track that over that's on top of the video track where your main content is. That's important because whatever's on top in Shotcut um, blanks out what's below it. But if you have this this uh, overlay thing that is transparent, then it's not going to block out except that part that's in your blank block. It might be easier just to show how this works. Okay, I'm going to start. Uh, I have my screenshot, and I'm going to, uh, here's my example, and I'm going to open in GIMP uh, this, okay, here's my screenshot. And what I'm going to do, my objective is to blank out this part here. So uh, I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to add a new layer, and I'm going to be, just to add a new layer. So the new layer's on top of here. See, it's filled in white. And then I'm going to mask it out. My mask thing is right here. Ma yeah, right there, mask. Okay, now I'm going to select black, uh, full transparency. Black means full transparency. Okay, there it is. Now, look at this. It's, you have this white layer here, but it's masked out. We're working on this, so we're working on the layer above this. So now I'm going to select and draw myself a, a, um, a rectangle over the part that I want to obscure. Now again, this, this um, screenshot is only to use as a guide. I'm only using this to be able to put um, the location of that blank spot. Now I want to bucket fill this uh, thing over top. Uh, and so I'm going to make that all white. Notice I'm I'm working on a on it hasn't created it just yet, but it will in a minute. So come on here, keep going. Show me stuff. Okay, that's running. Okay, now 
uh, going to select my color. It doesn't matter. I want it to be the same color as the background. And then bucket fill that. Aha! Now, now you see over here in the representation, I've got my blank screen except this uh, bucket filled area here that it's showing. I want to add some text to it. So I'm going to add a text box to overlay it. So I'm going to have another text box and I te now now I have another another layer on top of my other one. So uh, I have two empty text layers, but that's because that happens. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to save my file here so I don't lose my work. So this is what I want to actually show. Um, and so now I'm going to click the, um, okay, this shows what, I'm, what I've got here. Um, so now I've got a little bit of tweaking to do here because my text isn't exactly where the um, overlay is thing. So I'm gonna be very, okay, yeah, get that little, little plus mark sign there. To be, now I'm gonna resize my text to make it fit into my box here. And that's sort of like another tweak um, for this. So I'm gonna highlight the, get into the text box and highlight it. I'm just gonna reduce, in this case, this is my, just to be quick and uh, quick on it, I'm, I'm just gonna do it by reducing the font size uh, until it fits into my box. There we go. Okay, now I've got, um, so I got three layers here. I got the grayscale, which is not showing, I made my screenshot not showing. I got my, my box and I have the text on top of my box. Now I'm gonna export this to my PNG. So I think, am I done? Yeah, I'm gonna export it uh, to, um, I'm save it, yeah. And I'm gonna export it to uh, a PNG file or any image file, whatever, for, format's not important. As long as Shotcut can read it. I know Shotcut can read uh, JPEG and, and PNG. Yeah, but I don't think JPEG has an alpha channel. I think you have to use PNG. Okay, well, if, uh, okay, well, if H, if JPEG doesn't do an alpha channel, you have to you have to do PNG. I would default to PNG. Uh, I labeled this over, my overlay so that it would be easier for me to find. And so I think that that's the end. Okay, now I've got this. So here is my uh, save again. Oh, I save, save, save. Um, I have a reflexive control S, control S, control S. After you've been burned so many times, like it becomes second nature. Um, the uh, okay now this is what it's going to look like. That I brought my my screenshot back up just to confirm that I've got it everything where it's just blocking over what I want to block over. And so then I go back into Shotcut, and and so now I'm saving it. So. That is the, I think that's the end of this uh, video. Uh, here, okay, here's the result. Now I added a blue background just so you could see, um, but uh, the, what you would put into your video would not be the blue background. You would have, it would be full alpha channel, just, you know, just transparency. And so when you run this over top of your um, uh, uh, video, uh, it would blot out that part that you wanted to block out. Uh, the the only next thing to be considered is uh, posting it to YouTube, and this is something uh, this is a completely separate subject. But I thought it was worth mentioning. Is um, be sure you're logged into your correct YouTube account. Um, I ended up pushing the um, oh, what was the presentation we had in September? Um, that ended up in my audio production quick take, and I tried to move it, and YouTube wouldn't let me. Uh, Gur YouTube, I'm annoyed at you, um, but. Uh, so make sure you log into your right account. Have a description of the video. This is where you're planning again. Have a description of the video ready. Um, have a list of tags ready. Um, uh, as in many things, a comma sets a tag, uh, and you could have multi-word tags. Uh, so it's the comma that delineates it, not a space, in the case of YouTube. And I think many others, uh, uh, SoundCloud's the same way. Um, uh, YouTube is going to tell you don't close your browser tab after clicking publish. Uh, you want to leave it open. You could leave it open. Go do something else. Just leave that tab open. Uh, and you can return later to edit the description and the tags. If you think of something, oh man, I needed to add this tag. I, I've done that. I've gone back and changed it. And it's let me do that. So uh, that's just a thing. Um, important things to remember from all of this. And this is um, you know a list, uh, a quick list of things. 
know how all of the components are interacting with each other during recording. And again, this is the way Pulse Audio acts. The components you're interested in are your web browser, uh, OBS Studio, and Pulse Audio. And so you want to watch, watch for those. Um, in Shotcut, uh, when you're editing, after the video capture, this after you got your um, MKV file and you pulled the MKV file into your, uh, into your Shotcut uh, and uh, you're ready. Yeah, in Shotcut, you import files by opening them and then you drag them to the playlist uh, from the uh, center area, uh, main area, and that's the quickest way to put them on your playlist. You want to have that stuff put in your playlist. I still want to call it a staging area because that's really what it is. Um, and then you can you can do it with a bunch of menu clicks, but it's just as easy to drag it to a track from from the playlist. And when you drag something from the playlist to the track, it doesn't take it out of the playlist. So you can have multiple copies of it, you know, into the into the playlist. So uh, that that's that uh, multiple copies of a thing. Um, for example, uh, an image, a still image. You could bring that again and again and again and put it in different places and do different uh, different features and different um, filters and 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 uh, uh, different effects to it as well one thing that's really annoying about shotcut you might uh, you would read this in the forum posts and everything and a lot of people are annoyed by it uh, it must be difficult to code because they haven't done it is you could do this in open shot i don't know why they haven't done it in shotcut you cannot change the level order of layered tracks in shotcut it's not necessarily a problem, uh, uh, an unrecoverable problem, except if you have all these things that you really meticulously, minute little things you meticulously put together. Um, yes, you could control click every single one of them uh, and then drag them in mass up to a higher, um, the next level um, uh, uh, track, but that's fraught. Uh, that that's asking for if you miss even one, you're having to do all that some of that realigning all over again. So keep that in mind. A way to do that is to maybe have create some vacant or blank video tracks above where you're working. So if you ever did to add it, needed to add something on top of something, you have the space to put it in there. And then if you find you don't need it at the end, delete them. It, uh, that's one workaround, but it's just a workaround. And then the other thing, uh, final point uh, to be made, uh, uh, is edit the whole video before before exporting the audio. Uh, you know, to do all the work that we talked about earlier uh, for before rejoining to the project. And that's it. Questions, discussions. Um, you know. Uh, uh, I could probably uh, uh, kill the um, uh, impress thing here. I could probably do that and um, st uh, stop sharing that, and then we could go into... Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, there we go. Okay, questions? That's great, Mark. There's so many interesting tools that cost you nothing. It just takes a little bit of time to start to use them. And some of these are so feature-rich, like GIMP and... Audacity and you know these various tools that are out there. You'll probably, like you said, you'll probably use ten percent of the features, but it's very powerful features. I think the real, uh, the the probably the critical question after this presentation to see whether or not it was successful. Do each of you feel that you could now record a, a web session and record it and produce a video from it? One one thing uh, that that was pointed out also, and this is true for. A lot of software, when it's targeted for a particular particular group of people, not necessarily nerd, you know, nerds, you know, general ge general, you know, nerdism, is that uh, a lot of times, and you know, gimps this way, uh, you know, things like you know, if you're not if you're not in the desktop publishing world, or or years ago, I remember uh, CAD, uh, uh, Autodesk CAD, right? Right. I think a lot of amazing things, but if you weren't a draftsman, you were kind of lost. Right. You know, and so. I guess I guess one of the things that I never see in a lot of these tutorials is kind of a Rosetta Stone of scenes equals profile or something like that. That's that would help a lot of people that aren't necessarily audio engineers like you or or video en or video engineers uh, to to you know start with this stuff because sometimes the flight deck feeling is 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 absolutely true. I've I've experienced that. 
Absolutely. Yeah, there was a there was a video I saw where you know it was one of these tutorials, but it was a guy who works in Hollywood in special effects, showing you how to use Blender or some other tools to create a three D model and render it, and you know, and the speed they went through the various options and capabilities, like it was almost watching a master woodworker, you know, use a lathe. Like it was amazing. It was some little subtlety that was just critical, and you just missed yeah, it because yeah. it was a half a second of that you had to capture and remember and process in your head. <laughs> and it was one of these things where he's like, okay, we need to add a little spaceship to this scene. So what we're going to do is start with these basic shapes, and then he just like quickly manipulates everything into something that looks really cool. And, it, and it's like so fast, you know, how he does it. It's, it's, it's very impressive. So, yeah, I, I, Microsoft used to characterize their users of Word and Excel as like, Power users are survivors. So most folks would use like 10% of the features of the word processor, but they'd be able to write documents. And they were more the, the survivors. You know, they just know a little bit of the UI and that's enough to get by. <laughs> oh, you can go utterly crazy with Excel spreadsheets. I mean, just absolute crazy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's a really, a really interesting point about the craftsman aspect. Of it. Like, yeah, I think it it's the same thing would happen, you know, if somebody's watching me on a stream and working with Vim, like Vim is, that is my craftsperson tool. And I know it extremely well to the same level. Like I use GIMP like once or twice a year. And every time I go in there, I'm like, I know I need to scale something, but where the heck is that option again? Because they've also moved the menu too. Yeah, they move stuff around <laughs> and like, you know, I just don't use it frequently. Right. So yeah. I, I don't keep, I can't keep retain any of that knowledge in my head, but you know, with my text editor, that's a totally different story. Right. Like I'm just, always in there doing stuff so you know, it really does come come down to can you make the 10 percent that most the average person needs really obvious um, and not every tool seeks to do that some of them desire to be power tools that are only meant for power users so i guess it's a question of like what is your what is your demographic that you're trying to reach are you trying to have a good on-ramp or is efficiency like so important to you that like you're just going to say the people that really care are going to learn it. Um, I think that probably an overlay, probably a workaround for that would be sort of like an overlay. Remember the old word perfect uh, overlays over the keyboards or, or that kind of thing where the, you know, F five did this or whatever. I forget, you know, but, um, but another thing, for example, I kind of felt like I did a little bit of that with talking about shortcut today. Okay. This is, you don't have to worry about all this. Go here. You know, um, yes, you can use the menu to, uh, to you know, place, a, place a, a component on a timeline. Just drag it, you know, and then you can move it from there. And you don't need, that doesn't take a, you know, you don't need a PhD in shortcut to do stuff like that. Yeah, also, yeah. Some of the filters in GIMP, though, like you do need some background and image manipulation to even understand what the filter is trying to you do. You need to understand what's going on underneath the hood yeah. with the files, you know, yeah. But also, too, like I said, sometimes there's just a steep learning curve of, you know, like what you mentioned, Mark, about scenes equals profiles. That that rang it, yeah. it, it, you know, immediately. And, you know, I and, and you know, I haven't poured all over Shotcut's documentation. But I, like I said, there, there's that Rosetta Stone that that brings it down to, you know, something more common. I know you realize that your target should be people that understand the subject matter, but there should be some glossary or something off to the side of, you know, by the way, this is this, you know, that's sort of, it's just one of those. One of those things when you're, you know, when you're not, when you're not born into that, you know, like Vi, Vi is all, you know, or sorry, Vim, v Vim's all muscle memory. And yeah, like you, I'm very used to that, but, uh, you know, modeless text editors aside and everything else, that is kind of like using a power tool. Whereas, yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and, and thank you for confirming that they did change some of the menus in Gag. Yeah, I, I used that the other day and I could have sworn I was lo more lost than I normally was. And I did not catch the fact it moved around. So thank you. And one other thing I found interesting, Mark, is you said OBS Studio is used professionally quite a bit. Yes, so, it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm curious, like, did GIMP ever really displace Photoshop? Is Photoshop still the gold standard in certain applications? Like, what's the, you know, how do these things map to their commercial counterparts? I don't I'm know. I'm pretty positive GIMP did not never displace. Yeah, I know, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But, like, OBS Studio, this open source um, you know, video uh, capability sort of being used professionally. Like, what was the professional thing that got thrown out because of you know, OBS? Or I don't think there was anything that got thrown out uh, as a result of it. I I think there were just um, probably uh, stations that just didn't have a capability 
Uh, yeah, the money to buy it or, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and also from uh, OBS Studio um, uh, provides audio. There's also another thing called, I think, I forget what, Clean Feed, I think, uh, for audio. Uh, that's another thing that a broadcast, some broadcast, especially in Europe, you know, have used uh, over, send audio over IP over the internet, uh, where it used to be back in the day, uh, broadcast stations would have to use what they used to call conditioned telephone lines. You know, not basically all that was, was that's just capacitance, you know, on the, on the line to allow it to pass, you know, a, a wider audio bandwidth is basically all it was. Um, but you paid a lot for that, for to have the phone company do that. And then they had, uh, you know, that ISDN, you know, never really <laughs> um, beyond a certain limited area really gained any traction uh, because it was too expensive basically and uh, that was one of the reasons uh, um, but but uh, uh, the it was it didn't really replace anything that um, you know I don't know there was any professional uh, thing that that OBS studio replaced it simply added capabilities that entities that didn't couldn't afford their own custom solution uh, yeah. uh, no just didn't do you know, until, you know, they had this and then now they can. Yeah, I just did a Google search for OBS Studio versus, which is something I commonly do and I want to do a comparison, I want to do the autofill to like, what are the other options? Oh, awesome, yeah. And uh, the only one I recognized was Camtasia, which, you know, is still in use, but that, even that is not, it's not a streaming product. It's a desktop no. recording software for other purposes. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I think uh, OBS Studio has proven itself to be like best of yeah. breed for yeah. this paradigm of streaming right. services which is uh you know it's cool that open source like i i often like compare it to you know look at look at databases out there and postgres is the one that comes to mind is like this is a best of breed database that it you know it will it doesn't beat every other database on every feature no. but yeah. if you yeah. want to do gis support like postgres that is that is the best of breed there's place precious, to go for geospatial stuff and, oh, there's, and so you know there there are open source software out there that like there's no better tool and that's kind of that's pretty there's cool. precious little that postgres can't do that oracle can uh, and, and if you need that professional support there's companies like crunchy db or enterprise EDB, db right yeah that, that will support postgres you know absolutely like, so, so you you can get that sort of licensing throat the choke if that's something your company requires or your agency requires Right, or 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 paying for the support in Postgres is a lot cheaper than paying for you know one of your uh, standard you know uh, database company support. Uh, that one, one thing one thing I'd like to share with you guys quickly, if you'll indulge me. So, my in laws are incredibly hard to buy for, and I wanted to give them something interesting for Christmas. So. I, this is related to your audio file discussion, Mark, where I did do some editing using Audacity. So my, I had my nieces record their children saying 79 different phrases. So it's about three minutes of audio per kid. And then I was able to use Audacity, clean up noise, chop those up. And it's a, it's a Google Home or Google Assistant type box so it's a do-it-yourself google assistant it's activated by a button but i have a special greeting that happens before you can talk to google assistant so you guys ready go good morning nana and poppy today is november 7th the time is 11 30 a.m the current temperature for waynesboro is 70 degrees the current temperature for Ocean City is 68 degrees. Goodbye. That's awesome. Well, goodbye. Bye for now. Hope you and your loved ones are safe and healthy. That's pretty cool. That's fun. That's awesome. <laughs> so what was impressive about that, and this is a shout out to Matt since he leads the Python group. I thought converting numbers to ordinals or words like, you know, Taking one and saying first or taking one and, you know, expressing it as a word one would be a challenge. It wasn't actually hard at all. There was an existing library called Inflect that did all that work for you, where you could convert a number to an ordinal and then convert that to a word. It, it just, it was, it was baked. And then to get the current 
temperature or weather information for locations, there's something called Open Weather Map yes. or Open Weather Manager. And there's a Pi OWM library that just makes it dirt simple to get an API key from, you know, register with Open Weather Manager, get an API key, and then just make like three or four lines of Python to say, hey, I need the current temperature in Fahrenheit for this location. Boom, done. So it's like, it was, the code is amazingly simple when you look at it. I'll post, I put it up in GitHub. I'll, I'll put the link if you guys want to take a look at this. Um, Pretty cool, and I also li I also uh, list out the phrase list. So if there's if you want to do this with your kids, it's pretty straightforward to, for them to speak certain words. So let me uh, let me post this in the chat here. So there's a little systemd service file that means this will start up on, you know, when the system boots. There's a, a little Google demo file that I modified for the push button action, adding the greeting. And then the, there's an assistant JSON. So some of these things, to get the Google Assistant to work, you have to register with Google. And there's specific fields you need to fill out in that JSON file. And then there's an API key you got to fill out in the demo file. But everything else is very simple. And you just drop the, uh, the kids phrases into the two directories for each child that you recorded. And then I just randomize which kid says which phrase. So, and then the phrase list dot text has all the phrases that they need to record. So there's 79. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Well done. That, that, that is very cool. And I'm sure, I'm sure the parent or grandparents liked it too. So, well, it's, they're going to get surprised at Christmas when they hit the button, but it'll be a special Google Assistant with their own great-grandchildren <laughs> greeting them with the date, time, and temperature. So I think that'll be fun. That is very cool. Well, if there aren't any other questions on, our, on today's topic, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.